So if you have a LDAP user that you want to see what their password line would look like, that would go into the Etsy password file, get a password and then username will give that to you. So some issues with DNS. DNS uses round robin. So what that means is if you put in multiple IPs for the same host name, DNS will reply with the IP for that host name in a round robin fashion. It'll first give you dot one, and then it'll give you dot two the next time it's looked up. Although that is a nice feature to have, it doesn't give you high availability. If one of those IPs is down, it's still going to return that IP. So it does give you the ability to do round robin, but that cannot be used for high availability means. And that should you should make sure that when you do set it up, you keep that in mind. Another issue is with the DNS outage, if you take out uh, the master DNS server, eventually the entire DNS infrastructure will go down. There, will, there are typically slave servers built that will copy themselves from the master server, but after a set amount of time, if they aren't able to contact the master server, then they will stop answering uh, clients' questions on IPs and hostname lookups. So that does give you a single point of failure with that. Usually you have hours or weeks for the master to be down before the slave servers stop responding. So it's unlikely to be a problem. But because of the redundancy of having masters and slaves, you may not notice that there's an issue with your master DNS server until after the slave servers stop responding. So there should definitely be monitoring things out to protect you and it lets you know that there's something wrong with the mass server before, there, before it causes a more severe issue. Um, with that uh, DNS redundancy, there isn't currently a redundancy model built into the DNS master server, although you can use any normal high availability means to make it redundant. It's definitely recommended, but it's not built into it by default. Um, why bind DNS? Why am I talking about bind? And, other than it's the best solution ever. Applause <laughs> 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 uh, for that. Uh, so Bind is the leading DNS server across the world. Uh, literally 9 out of 13 root DNS servers choose Bind. Choose the DNS people choose it. Why would any of the roots choose any other? So the company reasons. that makes Bind, ISC, I can't remember what that stands for. Internet Software Consortium. Thank you. Um, they're actually one of the root DNS servers. Uh, a handful of them, I think it's like three or four of them, are essentially the US government through uh, Department of Information Security Agency, uh, the Navy, the Army, NASA, and then a number of other ones. Um, so Bind is very secure, it's very easy to work with. Uh, it's all text file based, which we're all Unix, Linux guys here, so we love text files. There's nothing better. Um, some of the features of Bind are uh, TSIG for signing your DNS server, signing your uh, zone files, so that you have some security involved there. Uh, it also has views, which views, when I first heard about them, I'm like, this is the coolest thing in the world. A view is essentially, you have one DNS server, and depending on who asks you, asks you for a DNS name or for a IP for a host name, it'll give you a different answer based on where you're coming from. Essentially, if you have a DNS server set up in, at your home headquarters and you have remote offices using the same DNS server, then you can have your remote offices get different answers to queries than your home office. So when you have a Active Directory server set up at each remote office and then one at your home office. A user looks up the Active Directory name. Each one will get a different IP based on where lo they're located. So they don't have to come all the way back to the home office. They can go wherever's closest to them. Uh, other DNS versions are uh, Microsoft there. Okay, quiet. Uh, LB named is very similar to BindDNS. It stands for Load Balancing Name D. 
it gives you some high availability with DNS. It actually has clients installed on the other systems, so that when it gives an IP address for a lookup like a web server, it will base it will, it will look at all the different web servers you have that are serving that page, and give you an IP address for which what whichever web server is the least active at that moment in time. It's not really used very often. I don't think it's, I think it's been decommissioned. But it's still kind of a cool idea for it taking DNS and making it highly available, or making a service highly available from it. Uh, LDAP is also capable of, DN, of doing DNS, because LDAP is capable of doing pretty much everything. And then I, uh, NIS can do some type of DNS-like queries. It essentially, it's like a centralized version of Etsy host, but it still serves the same purpose, and the system can look up DNS queries to NIS the same way, and NIS Plus as well. So what types of DNS servers do we have? We have caching-only server, a forwarding server, a master, and a slave. Caching-only server is the easiest server when you install by DNS, by default, it's a caching only server. So you don't have to do anything but install it and point systems to use it. Essentially what it will do is when you look up google.com, it will then go out to the internet, find out what the IP address is for google.com, and then it will store it locally for a set amount of time. So that the next person that comes to it looking for it, it doesn't have to go to the internet for it. A forwarding server will just forward every request onto another DNS server. It doesn't do anything itself, it just passes passes the buck onto someone else that will have the answer. Forwarding servers are useful for when you have a enterprise and Windows is running their own DNS server and Unix Linux are, is running their own. You can forward requests from your DNS server over to the Windows server, depending on which IP it is, which domain they're looking up. Rather than having to keep everything on your box, you can get it all forwarded to the correct place. And they can do the same back to the Unix, Linux DNS server. A master server is a DNS server that is the authority for the records it contains. So if we have example.com as our domain, the master server is the one that decides what the IP and the host name and what they are and how they match up together. There, it's the only one that can actually make that call. A slave server will connect to the master server and pull down a copy of it. The slave server's response will not be an authoritative response on it though. It is based on that response on what it's told by the master. A slave server cannot change the information that's given. It can only take the information from the master, keep, save it locally, and answer queries based off of that. So a server a DNS server can be multiple of these things at one time for different parts of the IP space. You can have it a master server for your 10 network. Have it be a slave server for your 192.168 network. Have it forward your 172 network off to the Windows system. And have it do all of these things all on the same DNS server. So, some keywords to know for DNS servers. This is where I think a lot of people that first come into DNS get confused because you start talking about A records and C names and PTR or pointer records and you're going, well, what are all these things and why doesn't that make any sense? An A record is essentially just a host name being resolved to an IP address. You have a host name listed, you say it's an A record, and here's its IP. A C name is just an alias for that name. It doesn't point to an IP, it actually points to another host name. So when you look up yahoo.com or www.yahoo.com, it's not actually associated with an IP address. It's associated with another host name that is then associated with one or more IP addresses. So where that can be helpful is www is a horrible host name for a server. Typically, you'll call your server web server in this building, blah, 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 and you'll have your own naming convention for your systems so that you know where the system's located, what its purpose is, what OS is on it, things like that. 
Then what you'll do is you'll set up www as an alias or a C name for the host name that you call it. A PTR record is the opposite of an A record. It knows the IP address, it converts that to a host name. Now, you, it would seem that you could just reverse the A records and that would be good. Why do we need a whole other record for the reverse lookup? There, there are cases, especially with web server or with uh, web servers and email servers, where if they don't match up, you might have an issue. You might have to have the host, the IP address match to the host name as well. So you can set up all your A records and PTR records to be the same or different if need be. Uh, MX is a mail record. It essentially says, this is a mail server. Going back real quick to the dig-t Gmail, if you ran that, it will give you all of the IP addresses for all the mail servers that Gmail uses. So you have to actually specify that it's a mail server in the DNS uh, config file for that zone. Uh, NS is similar, it's for other DNS servers, it lists all your name servers. And there are some services that will pull the NS records to get a list of all the DNS servers in your environment from a DNS server skip. Uh, bind files to know. Here's what I love about bind, it's so simple. You have essentially two files you need to care about. You have the name d.conf file, which is your main config file that says how to set up your DNS server, what all the options are. And then you have the var name db dot something files. Now the dot something is a name you actually make up. You can call it anything you want. There is a general standard to it. But essentially you're going to take that db dot file and mention it in the name db.com file so that you know what it does there and what its purpose is. So look at the name db.com um, actually, I'm going to pause here for a second. Does anyone have any questions about this so far? So the, the public internet has 13 master servers, or master uh, DNS servers. Root yes. Root servers. Now, there are some other networks that are not the internet. Yes, like private networks. Um, no, so kind of like private networks. Uh, there, are, there are some groups, and I don't know the names of any of them, they're, I'm guessing, really small, and no one actually uses them. But they're kind of like mini internets, not attached to the internet. They have their own DNS server. So you're not going to connect up to them with that <coughs> um, And I only know that because I read it on Wikipedia a couple days ago. So I don't know anything more than that. But it'd be kind of like a private network. Yes? And some of those 13 servers are not actually individual servers. You may have a, a hundred yes. or two hundred machines. None of them are individual servers. They're DNS services, yeah, okay, right, right. but they're clustered right. all over the place. They're in multiple locations physically, not just multiple data centers, but multiple states, multiple countries. So that, they're kind of yes. 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 They're using a geo cluster so they can be geographically separated, but still be able to fail over between each other. Yeah, when you, uh, when you install uh, Bind, you get a file that contains the IP addresses of those 13 servers. Yes. Because your Bind has to know how to find, I mean, your name server has to know how to find exactly. the root servers to start the process. Yep. yep. And if you want to look up those IPs, um, they all have a really easy to remember host name. The first one is a.name-server.com. Yeah. The second one is b. Next is c. <laughs> Don't see a pattern? Yeah. So they go from a to m. Um, there is no rhyme or reason about the letters in them or how it was set up. Uh, randomly, they're in the US or randomly, they're government servers. It's not like a, b, c, and d are government servers or US servers. I think a, c, a and C are in the U.S., but B is not. So I don't know how they actually figure out who got A and who got B. 
but they, they may have been in the U.S. to begin with. Maybe. Things move around. Yeah. Um, I, I think originally almost all of them were in the U.S. and then they relocate a bunch to other countries for security purposes. Occasionally you get an update on that root server's IP address list. Yes. That, uh, yeah. When the servers move. Yes. And because there's 13 of them, if one of them goes down and changes IP, you can get the update from another one. That one system changing its IP doesn't matter. Yeah, if, all the same time. if they change them all at the same time, then we might have an issue. <laughs> that might break the internet. Um, but realistically, even if they change them all at the same time, you still have weeks to get the update before all of the other DNS servers that your systems actually talk to lose their cache, because they are set up as caching only servers as well. And they can cache it for multiple weeks. Um, in the next file we're going to get to after the name d.com, you can set up how long that record is allowed to be cached. And that's what actually determines how long 13 servers would have to be down to affect anything. Uh, so the name d.com file, so any other questions? Uh, the name d.com file is fairly simplistic. It's just a couple uh, brackets with some information in it. Uh, the options that are your primary things, these are like the default settings. Uh, directory lists the directory where those db.star files are actually located. So you can change that if you want. Slash var slash name d is the default place. Uh, version, get lost. Um, I'm not a big fan of security through obscurity, but that doesn't mean we should give out all the information that we have just so that we're not hiding it. <laughs> um, so you can set the version. If you don't put that line in there, it will print out the default version that is, it'll print out the version that it's running as automatically. Um, if you put that in there, just in double quotes, whatever message you want. Put Microsoft Windows in. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's a honey pot, see who wants to mess with it. Um, allow transfer. Uh, so a transfer is another system connecting to DNS saying, I want everything. I'm a slave server, I want a copy of everything you have. Just send it to me as quick as possible. By default, you probably don't want to allow transfer to anyone. Allow recursion is a list of IPs that are allowed to do recursive lookups against you, which means they'll ask you a question that you have to then go ask another DNS server for the information. You want to lock that down as well to your environment because if you don't, someone outside your environment could ask you multiple recursive questions and essentially DOS or denial of service your DNS server by keeping you so busy with their pointless questions that you're not able to answer questions for a legit clients that are trying to figure out how to get to your web server. Uh, you can set up logging so that you can log exactly what you want. Uh, logging is fairly simple. You can set this up for logging to syslog. This is set up to, this is setting up a logging channel first so that you list the file, how many versions of that log file you want, and the size of it, so you know when to rotate it and delete old copies. The severity is what level of logs you want to save. Uh, then the print severity, print time, and print category are just extra information to print in that log line, so that you know that you care about seeing the severity, you care about the time that it happened, and the category that it shows up as. And then here we have the category default, so that we're going to actually use this for our default log server. So all of our default logging messages will go to that channel, which is listed above it. Uh, the next section is listing out zones. A zone is a group of systems, or a group of DNS entries that you want to be able to resolve against. So the, I'm going to skip the first zone of dot for a minute and go down to example.com. If we have the domain name example.com and we have a handful of systems in that domain, we will put those all together as one zone and list out all of our host names and IPs in that. 
Now, in that, we'll, we'll, we will not list out our PTR records. We won't do our reverse lookups for IP to hostings. We'll only do hostings to IPs and do our mail servers and our name server servers and our CNAME records as well, but we won't do the reverse lookups. The type for that is master because this is going to be the master server for this zone. The file that contains that information is going to be called master slash db.master.com.example so that we know that this is the master for example.com. Uh, we're going to allow transfers <coughs> of this whole record to 192.168.23.1 and then .23.2. So those two systems would be the slave servers that we're going to allow to have copies of these systems. As you can see, it's separated by a semicolon. Uh, semicolons will definitely mess you up in this config file, so make sure that you put them where they're needed. They have to be there for the end of the line, and they have to be there for the end of the section. And they're, so within the allow transfer, we have the 192.168.23.1, then we end that section with a semicolon. Then we do the next one, which is the dot two, ending a semicolon. And then we end that group. I think I have a typo in there. <laughs> and then we end that group with the squiggly bracket and that semicolon. I have an extra parenthesis and a semicolon in there that should not be in there. I apologize for that. Um, so, yeah, yeah. It'll tell you. yeah. Um, that's one of the awesome things about Bind too is when it airs out, it usually takes you a minute to look at the log file because it you think it's something else. But when you finally get around to looking at the log file, it flat out tells you what the issue is. It'll say in this file on this line, I see too many semicolons, and you'll look and go, oh my, of course, we delete that and that's good to go. So make sure whenever you have issues with DNS server, look at the log files first. And it'll air out when it's starting off. And you'll probably see it fail to start off and then check out the log file, see the error fix it. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is this zone down here, which is 0 0.168.192. Yeah, um, so for our example.com, let's say our example.com sits in the 192.168.0 network. That will be the reverse lookup for it. The Entry is in reverse order. So if you were 192.168 network, you weren't a class A. I think you the class A and class C is mixed up. Um, but if you're 255 host, then you do the dot zero. If you're bigger than that, you can drop the dot zero and make it larger and take up the whole 192.168 network. Uh, for, in this case, we're a type master, and we list our file there at the bottom. Um, zone local host, stopping up a little bit, and then I'll do the dot host. Zone lo local host is when you're pointing to DNS, you need to be able to look up the local host. Typically, machines look at local host and see 127.0.0.1, and they know that's themselves. A lot of applications out there use that fact so that their applications can run quicker and they don't have to go out to the internet to come back to their to its local box. If you point to DNS directly, localhost may not resolve if you're not using Etsy host. Usually localhost is defined in Etsy host. So DNS actually defines it as well for localhost to point to 127.0.0.1. Uh, that is put in there by default <coughs> in small bind. It automatically shows up in this file and it shows up with the DB file already created. So you typically never have to do anything with it. Uh, zone dot is a pointer to all the root servers. So that if you're looking up something that isn't defined here, you can go to the root servers to find the answer. And those would be the 13 servers we talked about before. Uh, so when we look at the master db.master.example.com file, this is what it looks like. Uh, so the first line is our TTL, which is our time to live. That's 
how long this information is good, that's how long people are allowed to cache this information. If this is something for a web server that never changes its IP, then we will make that a longer time frame. If it's something that we change constantly, we'll make it shorter. So you set that TTL based on how often you expect any of this information to change. If this information changes, for example, if our server Fred gets a new IP, it will take up to 24 hours in this case for every server that has accessed it to be able to get that update. If during that 24 hour period, we really don't know what answer the clients are going to receive. It could receive the old answer, it could receive the new answer based on where when it received its cache. So if it received its cache 24 hours ago, it's going to update and get the new one. If it just received its cache before we changed it, it's going to wait 24 hours before it actually looks it up and gets the correct answer again. So if you're making significant DNS changes, you may actually want to decrease that time as you get closer to your actual change to the point where you get down to a couple minutes, make your change, and then convert it back to 24 hours or a week or whatever you typically set it to. Typically for web servers and internet facing things, the IPs don't change that often. They're typically static IPs that may never change. So you can set that to much a much larger value. Just make sure that when you are ready to change it, you decrease it as you get closer to the date so that you don't have to wait a week before the change actually takes effect everywhere. Uh, origin is where is the domain that this is actually part of, in this case, example.com. Um, the next slide is our old record name. Uh, ns1.example.com is our server. Postmaster.example.com is not actually a name. It's a email address. That <coughs> translates to hostmaster at example.com. If there are any issues with this zone file, that's the default place to email it out to. So sometimes you'll see it say root.example.com or some other name. Essentially, you take your email address, replace the at symbol with a period, and you have your entry for that. Uh, the serial number is the is constantly incremented every time you change the file. When a slave server connects to a master server, it looks at the serial number to determine whether or not it has the most recent copy. If its serial number is greater than or equal to the master serial number, he knows he doesn't have to change. A typical standard that's kept with it is to use the date that you make the change in that file in reverse order. So it'll be year, month, day, and then a zero one or a zero zero. And as you make changes throughout the day, you'll increment that last number. And then when the day changes, you'll revert it back to a zero one and change the date. That way you know it's always incrementing. You never have to worry about having to lower it. And a number that big can continue to increment for I don't know how long. So 9999, where that year is. Uh, the refresh is when should actually it can go on further because it'll increase by one digit. True. So that number, I don't know what the limit is on that number. I know it's a lot bigger than this. So you could just add it to the year ten thousand and keep going. Um, three uh, three H <coughs> refresh is uh, three hours and the slaves should refresh their copy of this file. Uh, 15 seconds, which maybe should or should not be seconds, is if that refresh fails, how long should it wait before it tries to refresh again? In this case, it'll wait 15 seconds and then try again. And if that fails, it'll wait another 15 seconds and try again. You can set that to wherever you need it to. It will retry forever. <coughs> Every 15 seconds, I'll try again until it succeeds. Uh, this is set to expire in one week, which means after a week of not being able to refresh itself, it will give up. It won't. It, it will continue trying to refresh, but it will stop answering clients' queries about the information in it. So that's essentially saying having the name server say, 
if you haven't talked to me in a week, the information you have that probably out of date, I don't want you using it anymore, just stop responding to everyone. Um, and then three hours is the minimum amount of time that's allowed to do a refresh. Uh, in here we have a couple records set up. We have a name server set up with ns1.example.com, which would actually be the primary server. We have a mail record and MX record set for mail.another.com. And that has a number in it, which is a 10. You, that 10 is a weighted, is a weighting for that record. If you have multiple mail servers, each entry can have its own weighting to determine which mail servers should get the most mail. Uh, if all your mail servers are equally powerful, you may set them all up with 10s. If you have one server that's extra